And so now this is our very, very final uh, keynote, and I hope that you have seen in the last two weeks or a subset of that, as long as you have been around, that a lot of discussion we had was touching on various aspects of how we can design experiments and analyze the data in the way that is most effective and ensures reproducible research. And therefore, it is a very special pleasure for me to welcome Rudy back so that we can really close this specifically on the discussion of reproducible research. Okay, thanks for staying around um, to the end. And uh, I hope you heard the Olga's message that those who got support from NIH should put a good evaluation in. <laughs> <laughs> she was not allowed to say that. Okay, so uh, this is the menu what I'm planning to discuss this afternoon. Um, we should be able to generate reproducible research results. This is specifically focused on proteomics for two reasons, which I briefly will discuss. For political reasons, for scientific reasons. Then I go into the specifics of proteomics. I'll discuss briefly, very briefly, that <coughs> these two points, if two or more people have the same proteomic data, can they generate the same results? And if two or more people have the same sample, can they generate the same proteomic results? This is going to do very, very fast because Ben and uh, Brendan already touched on those, actually did a quite extensive discussion on those. And then the third question I would like to discuss, if two or more people do the same experiment in a cell line, do they get the same results? Even assuming that they use these techniques which can provide inter uh, reproducible results. Okay, let's plan. So why do we talk about reproducibility? It is a big issue in the life science research. Now it become a big issue over the last few years. Uh, this is going back to roughly half a decade now when, when papers started to appear where scientists have tried explicitly, mostly scientists from companies, to take research results which were in papers and to reproduce them in their own, uh, in their own laboratory. And the results were quite uh, worrying, to some extent, abysmal. So this is, for instance, a very highly celebrated study where um, a number of articles were, tri were selected which were important articles, and they tried to reproduce them in the company Amgen, and they could only about reproduce 10%. 10, 10 so now, the, and there's other papers that's, that go in the same direction, um, not to the same extent, but generally it, we have a reproducibility issue in biology, and this is not good. Uh, it's not good for scientific reasons, but it's also not good for, um, for political reasons, because the U.S. government, which is of course only one government, others do also make huge investments. They invest several tens of billions of funding, and if you were to extrapolate to a 10% figure of reproducibility, it means that most of the money is wasted to generate results which are inherently not reproducible. This is clearly not a sustainable issue, and it is dangerous politically, and it is scientifically not satisfactory. So that's why um, we, we need to worry about that to some extent. And so that's what, what I'm discussing today. It is a complicated issue, and I'm discussing it mostly in the context of proteomics. So Nature Publishing Group, they have been very uh, at the forefront of this discussion, and they, they did a good job in a number of editorials and opinion papers to break the whole issue down into, into various topics. And so this is, for instance, a, a, uh, a, a picture from a special issue they, they published one time, and they, bro they broke this big topic of reproducibility <coughs> down to experimental design, reagents, uh, drugs, cells, and so on, data acquisition, statistics, validation, and so on. So it's not an it's not an inherent it's not a a, a global uh, single topic uh, issue. It can be broken down into pieces. 
And now in, in, in the context of this course, you of course learned a lot about design, about data uh, analysis, statistics and validation of data. And now I would like to do, then re-examine very quickly where are we in the proteomics field uh, with respect to these issues and then get to the issue of reagents result, uh, um, re research reagents. So how are we doing? We already, from a simply technical, technical level, I showed this slide already this, uh, on, on Wednesday. We showed that this, what this group, um, the diagnosis group, referred to as hyperreaction monitoring, which we, which we generically uh, discussed in this course as, as DIA or, or SWOTH, has the ability to do quite nice uh, results in terms of filling in this matrix, relatively few, uh, missing values with the, in contrast to the, the typical DDA data, and so this is clearly a good sign that we have made in the field progress for reproducibly analyzing cohort samples. You experienced in the practical, um, in the practical part of this uh, course, some issues. How how what are the issues about reproducibility, about accurate quantification, false positives. So these all factors, of course, in the in this. Um, in this discussion. But it seems, and I hope you would agree at the end of this course, that the field of proteomics has made actually quite a good progress and is on reasonably solid ground um, within the limits of that the techniques can provide. So why is this reproducibility important? It is certainly the question of can a research finding be reproduced by someone else given suitable instruction is the bedrock of experimental biology or experimental science in general. If it cannot be reproduced if something is not right and, and we need to not find out why it is. It could be that the hypothesis is wrong or something wrong in the, in the, in the, in, in the experiment or something else happened. Um, we cannot avoid the reproducibility issues if, if we do certain types of experiments like clinical or biomarker studies it, they depend on the comparison of multiple samples, so we, if the results are not reproducible, we'll never find a mark. Um, same is for correlative or association studies, and I think the politically difficult issue is that perceived poor, real, or perceived reproducibility is often construed with poor competency, they, people say they don't know what they're doing, or that they're flat out cheating. And I, I think we have to be, this is, a, I think, an important, um, in my view, important issue that we communicate as scientists that if something is not reproducible, particularly in the life sciences, it doesn't mean that people don't know what they're doing, nor does it mean they're cheating. And that's the last part I'm going to, to touch upon because bi biological experimentation is, apart from the technical issues which we can, to some extent, control, is simply more complicated than, for instance, a experiment in physics or an experiment in um, a typical experiment in chemistry. Okay, so this was kind of the political issue. Now I would like to get into why why um, we why we have to worry about this is reproducibility issue in the context of biological experimentation from a biological point of view. And my main argument now for the next few minutes is that variability is actually our friend. It is an inherent property of biological systems um, and that we should find ways to use the inherent variability in biological systems, which you could also call poor reproducibility of the system itself. We should try to use this to our advantage. So this is the, this is the, the message that I'm going to uh, expand on the next few minutes. So those who, those who have been trained as experimental biologists, um, they will have probably learned something um, which is in undergraduate and graduate school, do a controlled experiment. So what the controlled experiment means is you take an object, let's say this mouse, and you want to do an experiment with this mouse. For instance, you might want to um, knock out the gene from that mouse and see how does the mouse react 
to the absence of that gene. It's a very, very common experiment. So now what we are taught is we should, we should keep everything constant to measure the effect of this perturbation, the absence of this gene. So we would go, we select a strain of mice, we select a mouse of a particular age, we would select a mou mouse that and do the experiment, the measurement of the consequence, and at a particular day or time of day when the mouse is in a day-night rit rhythm. I mean, it's just examples that we basically would want to keep everything perfectly constant and have simply one variable because then we try to relate the result that we find, the difference in how the mouse the wild-type mouse, the knockout mouse is, we would then relate this to the effect, uh, as an effect on the perturbation. And then we would, so we change one variable, for instance, add a drug, delete the gene or whatever, and then we do measurements, uh, could be proteomic or otherwise, and then we say, this gene that has been knocked out causes cancer. It's of course a very simplistic example, but that's, that's the kind of conclusion many draw, and then they would make a generalization and say uh, if they found that a mutation in this gene or the absence of these genes in that, in that mouse they tested under these controlled conditions created cancer or showed some other phenotype, they would usually um, generalize from this observation, say, we have found a gene that causes cancer without having the conditional properties attached to, to this statement. So now um, I would like to quickly expand on this issue of generalization. A mouse is not a mouse. Uh, there's many flavors of mice, and, if, and the, the fact that mice survive out in the wild, where of course the laboratory mice came from, is actually a direct consequence that the mouse population is genetically and phenotypically different. If every mouse were exactly the same, were, mono, were clonal, and let's say a new um, same is true for human population, and a new um, virus or bacterium or, or, or some other threat came along, they would all react presumably similarly or identically, and if they, if, if they were susceptible to that threat, this bacterium or infectious disease, they all would be wiped out. The reason that they survive as a species and we survive as a species is that we have the population is variable, and this variability guarantees or has at least guaranteed to date that whatever came at the human or the mouse or the fly population, there were always some members of the species equipped genetically to deal with that threat. So many have maybe been wiped out by cholera or the pest, but a part of the population survived. Now we have, of course, the ability today to measure this, the, the, this variability, and this is a slide from a um, NSF project where a number of mice have been very, very, I mean, mouse strains that are used in the in the in, in the in the research have been sequenced um, by genomic sequencing, and it was observed, which is of course not a surprise, that these mice are different. They are genotypically different, and we would also expect that they are also phenotypically different. That if we did exactly the same experiment, except knock out exactly the same gene in different in different strains of this collection that they might <coughs> react differently. Some uh, in some this, let's say this cancer-causing gene might cause cancer and in other strain it would not. So we, what I'm trying to say here that all results that are coming out from these controlled experiments are conditional. Usually this conditionality is not presented in the research results. It is generalized <coughs> and that is, um, that is not a justified conclusion. In fact, those who, of you who, um, who are worried or, in, or, or preoccupied or involved in this field of precision or personalized medicine, this is exactly the root of the problem that should be addressed, that in a population, in a patient population, that looks the same to a, physio, to the, to a physician or, uh, or an oncologist, the, it, not everyone reacts in the same way. And, and one of the big goals of this precision medicine um, field is to find out how a specific genotype, in this case not from mice, but from humans, um, reacts to a specific treatment. So this is not just an academic discussion about mice, it has Im 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 immediate and strong implications also for 
uh, very active research fields in human biology. So, so this is the situation, and now I would like to ask, uh, since we are dealing with this variability, it has consequences on the reproducibility of research results, whether we can use this, in this variability to our benefit to learn new biology. So this is now the next few minutes. I would like to ask, can we use biological variability to learn new biology, or is it just confusing our research results? We learned to do controlled experiments for the reason that we would like to have clear answers to the questions we ask. And of course, if you have, have confounding effects like different genotypes, it becomes more difficult to learn something because it may just confuse the results. It may become very noisy. OK, so now um, I'm going to expand on this a little, how we can use, and many are already using, this variability as, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a means to do new types of experimentation. And these are basically population studies, which are actually, I think, extremely interesting and are now approachable <coughs> with the techniques we, we learned and, uh, in, in proteomics. In genomics, this has been already uh, feasible for a while. So let's look at this picture. We have a, two members of the same species. They're obviously um, different in a, in a very distinctive, easily detectable phenotype, and it's their size. So we, we would assume that the reason that this is person is very tall and this person is not so tall has some genetic roots. So we might want to relate the genetic variant of these individuals to the phenotype which is easily detectable. So this is usually done by association studies, and what we try to do here so SNPs is single nucleotide polymorphisms, which may or may not manifest themselves in a different uh, protein abundance or sequence. Um, but let's, let's just first say what we, what we do here. We would have a particular nucle nucleotide in the genome of these, people, these two individuals, which we sequence. There's, of course, many, many differences in nucleotides in these two genomes. But we would, we would then associate the, the size with the presence of a sequence variant. And we, we might find, if you're lucky, um, that when we measure, of course, not two people, but maybe hundreds or thousands or hundred thousands, that when a particular SNP, let's say a T versus a C, in this position, in a particular position, is it's, it's ordered such that the, whenever there's a T present, this is associated with a large, a tall, uh, a tall phenotype and then if the C is present in that nucleotide, so the sequence polymorphism in the C, it's associated with a small phenotype. There's other cases where we also have a SNP, and there is no association, so this is not informative in, in relative to this particular phenotype. But here, if we have enough individuals, and this separation between, uh, between the SNP and the trait is strong, then we have a, a, str a fairly strong uh, statistical reason to believe that they're somehow related, but we don't know really how. So now, um, this is strictly true. Um, this type of association will be very useful in case of Mendelian traits. So when we can say a particular gene, if mutated, causes a disease. Uh, the classical example is sickle cell anemia, when a mutation in a hemoglobin beta chain gene leads to a disease um, that manifests itself by different um, shape of, uh, of, um, of red blood cells, and the, pheno the phenotype is the shape of the blood cell. It has other medical implications, but there the association is very clear because the mutation immediately leads and is tightly linked to, a, to the phenotype, and this is the only thing that we know that affects this phenotype so there's a very strong link, and this is in Mendelian inheritance. So basically, you can trace down how this particular mutation uh, uh, distributes in a population based on some quantitative rules. Um, now I want to show that this is not usually the case. Usually, things are much more complicated. And I want to come back. So the inheritance is, not, is, is mostly not Mendelian. And I'll come back to these mice I talked about on Wednesday. And I said we generate, or a, a, a consortium of scientists generated mice that are um, derived about 150 uh, strains that are inherently 
intrinsically homogeneous, so they're basically each mouse of a strain is identical genetically, but they are different across strains, and but they share across the strains the presence of the two parental alleles partition in different representations or proportions. And so we also said that these mice have been extensively phenotyped. There's hundreds of phenotypes uh, that have been measured. One could be size, uh, average life expectancy, and so on. Okay, now let's examine some of these phenotypes. How they, how they, um, what well basically their inheritability um, pattern is in these mice. So the mice simulate kind of a population. Right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's kind of an inbred population. It's not an outbred population, but nevertheless, it's a population. So here we have the two, the two parents, the B and the D mouse, and we ask how do these specific phenotypes behave. One phenotype is BO2 max. This is an interesting phenotype for uh, athletes. This is basically describes how much oxygen a person, in this case a mouse, can burn as a, if, if you're a long distance, long distance athlete or to the France bike rider, your VO2 max will be high. You can burn a lot of oxygen and therefore produce more energy. If you're not athletic, you will have a low um, VO2 max. Okay, so this is a phenotype which can be measured with a, with a machine. And here we have the two parental mice in the B and the D mouse and in either low fat diet or in high fat diet when they're getting fat. And we see that two mice, uh, the strains, the parental strains have roughly the same VO2 max in normal food and they, they react differently to high, level, high food diet um, in, uh, in, in the two genotypes. We have another um, ph uh, phenotype here, serum alkaline phosphatase, actually used as a clinical marker to indicate um, uh, that something is wrong with the liver or bones. And, and then we see here that the two parental strains have inherently different um, serine alkaline phosphatase, phosphatase level when they are just living in their cage, and that but when they react to, when they have high fat diet, it becomes the same. So they react, they react differently, the, the, the baseline is different, here the baseline is the same, they react differently, here the baseline is different, and they converge to the same level when they have high fat diet. So the reason I chose this uh, in these two parental strains is because we can now look how we, how this phenotype distributes over all the strains. Remember, all the strains are composites of the two parental genomes, and this is now listing the, all these mice, I mean, a, 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 the, all the strains derived from the same parents originally, and this is the VO2 max phenotype list, and the mouse, mouse strains are listed in increasing um, VO2 max capacity. So what we see here is that the two per parents are very close here to the maximum level, and most of the reshuffling of these alleles in these mice creates phenotypes that are, are inferior to the two parents, way outside a Mendelian range indicated by these two, um, by the two parents. By Mendelian, by Mendelian genetics, it is not explainable how these two parents, if they breed, uh, can generate this, these phenotypes. It is, a, it is a sign of a complex uh, of a complex trait, which means it's composed of m multiple contributions or contributions from multiple genes. The same is here for the serum, serum alkaline phosphatase level. We see here the two, the the, the, the one parent and the, the other parent is somewhere is here, and the other one is here, and they create steady state. Um, alkaline phosphatase levels that are, again, far outside the range defined by the parents. So this means, basically, that most, so these are just two of these traits, and we, I could show many of, many more, and this is typically the case. So there's very few traits that we would measure that are actually Mendelian. Most of them are complex in the sense that multiple components add together. So now, um, I would like to show that we we can use this variability, the genetic and phenotypic variability, 
that we can measure, of course, we can measure phenotypes, we can measure um, genomic or proteomic underlying um, patterns, and uh, how we can use them to learn something new about complex biological processes that contribute or are relevant for the expression of a particular phenotype. So this is an experiment or a study that um, we did a while ago with a fly geneticist in our institute, Ernst Hafen, and the work specifically is from Hiro Yokokada, who is a postdoc who did this. The design was that we got access to, to flies, Drosophila, that were collected in a fruit market actually in Georgia, and so they were, they were then collect, call, um, fruit flies, Drosophila, these little tiny flies that, you, uh, set, that come to your banana when you let it uh, sit around. The, the tiny is the beautiful little, little animals, and so this uh, person, the scientist Judy McKay, went around a, fr a fruit market and collected a number of flies, and then she inbred them um, into, to make into homogeneous strains. So then, um, Hero measured the wing size. This is a highly selected phenotype of these flies. You can imagine if a fly has a very small wing, uh, it will die out. It will not be able to fly. If it has too, too large a wing, it probably also will not fly. So it's highly selective that the fly can actually uh, fly around in roughly the right proportions. Otherwise, it will be, um, will be eaten and wiped out. So then we measured the genome. Um, and we measured a proteome of one particular organ and come to that at the wing. Um, and then we correlated these proteome measurements with the phenotype to see whether we can learn from that some underlying biological processes which are re respect, re that are responsible for creating that observable phenotype. Okay, so this is this Drosophila genetic reference panel from Julie McKay. She collected a number of strains. Uh, it's, a, it's absolutely remarkable that these flies, which were in basically on the same banana in that fruit strain, uh, fruit stand, in somewhere in the world, are so variable. You might think that in they, they might they might if they if they live, live geographically close, they might be somewhat homogeneous, but they're not. But anyway, there's a number of this gene. Uh, then they were inbred for 20 generations. So eat for each mice, uh, for each fly again, we have multiple copies. They're genetically homogeneous, and they are the descendant of a fly that was in the wild type and has obviously been successful in this wild type because it survived. So these flies have different wing size. They may look quite homogeneous, but they're not. So we, we here did mono, mono, morphometric analysis of the wing. The wing is a beautiful, uh, a beautiful organ in the fly. And he could measure the area, he could measure the length, he could measure the, the width, he could also measure these, these tiny veins, how they, how they are being uh, formed in there. But we just talk about the overall size here. And so when he, when he then listed the wing size versus the strains, then you see that they, they're not all the same. So there's a range of, of size of this wing, exactly as if we were to line up everyone in here, uh, and by size we would all be of different size. Um, not radically, but so somewhat different size. Now, the amazing thing is that this, that is the variability, that is the genomic, genomic variability these mice express, even though uh, these flies express, even though they are living very close together as a population. In humans, we have about one in thousand base pairs is a SNP. So, if you were to sequence every one of us, we would find a, a difference every, every about every one thousand base pairs. Here, it's one to forty. It's an absolutely amazing number. So this is they're probably f about as far apart as a as a as a human and a, and a, and a chimpanzee, and they're still of course same species and and live very close together. This is just for cancer genomes reference numbers. Okay, so this is the start of the position of the experiment. We have this. Uh, I should the the other thing I should add here is that these wings grow out in this in the fly out of wing disc. So these are uh, uh, imaginal discs. These are um, clumps of cells of about a thousand cells that are put away in the emerging uh, fly, I mean the, in the larva, and they will eventually lead to this disc. So these cells that are in here in this imaginal disc, this wing disc, will eventually be the, which is extractable from the larval stage, will be eventually the cells that form the, the, the actual wing. So we, we collected these wing discs from a number of these cell lines from big uh, 
from small wing, small wing cell, uh, flies and from big wing flies, and we then did um, mass spectrometric ana analysis through the ways that you learned here, DIA measurements, and we analyzed the data in ways you uh, learned now in this course. So we basically generated, um, we generated protein maps from 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 cell from from flies that have a distinctive phenotype. This is the data that was generated. There is about 2,000 proteins we were able to quantify across all these um, flies, uh, these, these wing discs, and you can see then you do clustering. These have these are big wing female, big wing big wing male, small wing females, small wing male. You see they do not cluster part. I mean, there's some, some tendency that the big ones are different from the small ones, but it's only a general tendency. So what this means is that the differences we see in the protein pattern of these, either the females, the males, big wing or small wing, are very subtle. So it's not like there's a gigantic uh, black and white answer. Okay, but so then the question is, this is now when we come to reproducibility of research results. If you have something like that, you might give up and say, they look all roughly the same. We cannot see a uh, biological signal because they don't cluster apart. I mean, in the case of medicine, you might say we have a c cohort of cancer tissue, biopsy, a normal tissue, and if they don't cluster apart, then you would say, well, we have no base to distinguish the tumor from, from the benign tissue. And so here we then took, um, and this is Hero's work, he went a step further and he asked, do we, do we have in this data set biological signal? And he did that by correlating the, um, the, the various flies, the proteome maps of these various flies against each other. And he asked if we, have, if we have repeat measurements, biological replicates of the same wing disk, what is the correlation? And when we do biological replicates or comparisons between different uh, fly strains, is the correlation of these patterns different than from biological replicates? So that would mean that if, they, if this is the case, we would meet, this would mean that technically we're able to do measurements quite highly reproducible, but if we go then, if we add to, the, to that the biological variability, the pattern changes, that they're, they're more different than, te than technical or biological, re uh, biological replicates, and that means we were able to detect biological signal. So the cluster graph did not show a lot of biological signal, but this, this um, plot of the correlation coefficients from replicates and non-replicates, replicates would be within the same strain, non-replicates would be across different strains, means clearly they're separated, not perfectly, but they're separated, which means we have in this data set biological information that tells us something about the how the difference genomically translates into the proteome. This is another representation of this, and I think for this kind of cohort study, this is a very useful plot, where we would plot the coefficient of variation of all the various proteins detected for re replicates and for biological, I mean, for biological replicates or within the same strain, and for, for comparisons across strains. And if these two curves substantially differ, I mean, as they do here, then we would say the difference between these two curves is because this is a, a, a representation, an expression of biological difference and not technical variability. So this is a, this is a good sign, and I think we, we will appreciate immediately that if we can only generate such uh, graphs, if the method that we use has a high degree of reproducibility, if it is very noisy, we will never be able to distinguish these two curves, and therefore we will have to stop the experiment uh, right there. Now, we didn't have to stop the experiment right there because we were convinced that there is significant biological re the re results in there, and then Hero did a further analysis to try to find out which proteins or protein groups or biological functions correlate with a large or a small um, wing size and this is a somewhat complicated graph, and I just, well, I don't want to spend a lot of time of it, but the message is very simple. The underlying network here is a network of prior information how different proteins in the body interact with each other to carry out a function. So this is the string database or string network, 
and each, each node here would be a protein or a gene, and then the, the edges mean there's been some form of, of information has been accumulated that these genes or the proteins interact. And the interaction could be functional, it could be physical, um, or it could be regulatory. So this is not specified. You can specify that, but we don't specify that here. And, and on, to, on, top of this, uh, on top of this string um, network, Hero projected the proteins that were shown to be associated with long, um, large or small wing size. And you see here that certain clusters emerge, like modules emerge, which are highly connected and which are highly caught. So these would be areas of the cell's biology which have an association, simply data-driven, from, from starting with the phenotypic difference to then associating molecular patterns with phenotypic difference. And it shows that various um, areas of, this molec of the molecular functions of the cell associate with the, um, with, the, with the size of the wing. And this would be the cell cycle, glycolysis, chromosome, um, chromosomal protein, uh, um, like basically epigenetics and mitochondrial respiration. So the upshot is, if we, if we synthesize this into a small, into a picture, in a composite picture, we learned the following. We learned, so we have big size wings, small size wings, we do a data-driven analysis, we use the prior information to relate the patterns that we see, the association patterns, to molecular function, um, and we learn the following. So we have these SNPs, which, we, which are responsible or associated with the size of the wing. This is the phenotype, this is the genotype. We then learn that in between here, which is normally just one gigantic statistical association without any functional uh, in, information, um, and therefore if it's a multifactorial trait, it's very hard to learn something, we, we find out by using the proteomic data that certain mechanisms are subtly are, are subjected to subtle change. And these are actually the interesting thing was, these are very old fundamental processes that are shifted slightly from one state to the other that make the difference in, in determining the, the phenotype. And this is metabolism. So the, um, if, if the wing is, the size is big, we, we measure systematically a increase of, met, of glucose metabolism basically glycolysis, and a slight decrease in respiration. So this is for those who may, um, so it's a shift. The cell has two ways to basically generate energy. One is glycolysis, the other is respiration. And, there, and both are active in a cell, and a slight shift of actually a few percent is, is associating and probably causal for, the, for determining the wing disc size. Now for those who are reading or interested in cancer biology, this is, this is a very, very well-known shift in cancer metabo metabolism. It's referred to as the Warburg effect, which where cancer cells have a different proportion of metabolic um, activities related to, um, to respiration in mitochondria and glucose. So this has been recapitulated, obviously, over and over again, this shift, and it associates with, with wing size. We also see that the unpacking of the histone has an effect on the on the on the wing uh, wing size. So loser chromatin is is making the, the chromatin more accessible for transcription. And so we see factors here which lose the chromatin up. And this is also slightly associated with the big wing size or basically with the wing size. So the the um, summary that I tried to that I, or that the reason I I came up with this example is that, um, generally speaking, we learn that we should avoid any kind of variability in experimentation and keep all variables constant except one. And now here, we take advantage of naturally occurring variability. We take advantage of the fact that we can now measure in the field of proteomics, but also certainly in genomics, a repeat, do repeat measurements which are highly reproducible also from quantitative point of view. And then we can start to do cohort studies and use the roots of this bi biological variability to learn something about biochemical mechanisms that link the genome to a specific phenotype, which is, in this case, wing size.
and we uncover that very old fundamental processes, a slight shift in their proportion, how they're used in these cells, is, uh, is reflected then in the phenotype. And we think that this is a, a, a model or an approach that will also uh, be highly valuable in uh, the human cohort studies to get beyond statistical association of SNPs to, to phenotypes and that we can use these protein measurements to give, to, so, to say, so to say, functionalize the statistical associations from genome-wide association studies. So we think this is actually interesting. Interestingly enough, these, these old mechanisms um, are only slightly changing, a few percent, but we can detect that, and it obviously has an effect. And there is a whole, if you, if you were into this literature, there's a whole range of thousands of papers which talk about the regulatory um, mechanism like TOR signaling, insulin receptor signaling, which is, which is on top of these old processes here like respiration epigenetics. And we think that these complex regulatory mechanisms like insulin signaling or TOR signaling, uh, they are there to fine tune the performance or the function and the capacity of these very old fundamental processes, like also protein synthesis, is, is one of them that was also affected because there's also a signature in, in, in ribosomes. Okay, so what I basically try to show is that we can use variability as our friend to uncover biological context um, that is otherwise very hard to track if we have the ability to do reproducible uh, measurements across large cohorts. Okay, so now I'd like to go to the, this next two points will be very fast because you already heard that. I'd just like to reiterate a few points. I want to ask the question, if two or more people have the same proteomic data, can they generate the same results? This is an issue of um, data analysis which you, have, which you have basically spent now several days on. This would be, in this Nature Publishing Group graph, would be in the area of data analysis and data acquisition. This is the study that um, Brandon already referred to on Wednesday, and we generated a sample set that consists of three proteomes, a human, a yeast, and an E. coli proteome, and they are mixed together at a certain proportion here, like 65 to 15 to 20 percent, and we make a, a sample B where we have the same three proteins but mixed together at different proportions, 5 percent, 30 to 65 percent. So then each one of these samples is analyzed by mass spectrometer through the DIA techniques, and then this generated a data set that the developers of the various software tools that um, were uh, introduced in the course got together, and Brian, uh, Brandon very nicely explained how this was iteratively resolved, that people did an initial, an initial scan or, or an initial pass through their software, and everyone found some problems, the data did not, were not consistent, uh, Brandon very nicely described how then uh, by further analysis uh, the bugs were found or which could be corrected. And I don't want to go in, into that. I would just like to say, uh, Pedro Navarro, who, who was a postdoc in our group, uh, who, who developed this concept, and he actually built a, uh, a software tool which is called LFQ Bench, where which is a, a, a platform where such comparisons can be done, not just the software comparison but other comparisons as well. So this may be actually a useful tool uh, uh, down the road. This is the, the samples that were analyzed. And then I basically go to, to, that, um, to that graph here, which is what Brandon already kind of concluded. And it shows that after, after this initial iteration and after some uh, corrections and, and, and fixes, the, 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 the tools on this standardized data are converged quite nicely. So we have here peptides, about 30,000 peptides which were 34,000 peptides with, or close to 4,000 proteins, which were seen by every tool. And we see here for each individual tool that there is relatively few that were only seen uh, by, one, uh, by one software tool. And so we can say that these software tools um, 
given a certain data set, we'll do a, a fairly equal, not completely equal, but relatively equal job um, of identifying and quantifying the proteins with quite, quite accurately and quite um, with controlled FDR. Um, you probably also talked, I'm not sure, but you probably also talked about the non-library based tools like the DIA, DIA umpire, and this sees a few more, some more proteins, based on the fact that, of course, the, the library based proteins will not see a protein that if it's not in the library, and the, and the tool, the umpire tool, creates a library from the sample and may have proteins in, the, in, the, in its library that is created from directly from this cohort. So the, the answer to this in the DIA mass spectrometry world would be, if two or more people have the same proteomic data, can they generate the same results? The answer would be, I think, optimistically, yes. Not completely identical, of course, there is, there is some issues that always creep up, but it is quite consistent, certainly from the point of view of proteomics, is un, as an unprecedented consistency. And it does not even, it does not even depend just on one tool, different tools that have been developed in the community come up with relatively similar results. So now I'd like to go to the next point here, again very briefly because you heard this from Ben. Um, if two or more people have the same sample, can they generate the same proteomic results? This now goes to, again, data acquisition, data analysis, more to the data acquisition uh, part of it. So. This is this cross-lab study Ben talked about, where we generated a lysate of a human cell line, and into aliquots of this human cell line, we titrated in a, a, a range of uh, uh, aqua, pep aqua peptides, or isotope-labeled reference peptides, <coughs> at various proportions, so that the aqua peptides spanned um, a, a, a more than five orders of magnitude in their, in their dilution, and then these samples were sent to 11 laboratories somewhere around the world, and they agreed, each lab agreed to spend um, a day one, a day three, and day five in their laboratory to run every one of these days in, within a week, let's say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, seven samples um, that were coming out of this cohort. So basically each laboratory generated 21 analysis and this allowed us to this design allowed us to test how the same sample behaves within the same day in a laboratory or in different laboratories how to how a specific sample behaves in the same laboratory in the course of a week and of course across the laboratories so we can we can see how reproducible are the data generated um, within the same machine within a day within a week and across different geographic re regions and different machines. So um, this is a slide that Ben already showed. The key was to develop software analysis, uh, analysis software tools that keep this curve flat. This is, I think, is the most important part of this whole exercise that we succeeded through the development of these tools and appropriate FDR control that, we, that this curve is flat, which basically means that if you keep adding another dozen or, or 50 or 100 repeat analysis to your data set, that we do not discover um, or infer any, false, any additional false positives or very few of them. That means the FDR is properly controlled. And this is, I commented on that on Wednesday, is a critical, absolutely critical and frequently underestimated challenge from large cohort studies because there's a tendency for false positive to, to accumulate leading to a curve that might be creeping up here. The more data we add, the more false positives we might add. So this is quite nicely controlled. And when we look at the results in a, in a different view, this would be the proteins detected. We see that about 80%, uh, about 4,000 proteins, which is about 80% of the proteins detected, are about 80% complete in this repeat analysis. So clearly we see something we also discussed on Wednesday, and, uh, and this came up also in the discussion here throughout the, um, your practical uh, analysis, that if we get low, uh, so the proteins are, are linked, are, are listed here based on their signal intensity, when you get down to very low levels of, uh, of signal, 
then the signals become more erratic, become more noisy. This may simply be because the signal to noise is low, and you might imagine a, a signal that is barely sticking out of the noise level, and so in one sample you might see this peptide, and in another one you might not because, because it may be so slightly below your uh, de detection limit. So you create also, in, in the DIA method, which is inherently quite reproducible, but when you get to low signal to noise, you also, of course, create missing values. This, this cannot be explained biologically, incidentally, because the same sample was analyzed, so it's clearly technical, there poor uh, reproducibility, and I think we discussed uh, on Wednesday, and we also uh, found out by, by, with Brendan's analysis that proteins like those, um, which are noisy, uh, erratically detected, should be better eliminated for the benefit of the conclusions that can be drawn from the experiment. Okay, so then uh, I would like to summarize this, this part here. And by just saying, uh, if we talk about reproducibility of research results in proteomics, we are now, thanks to this uh, DIA methods, in pretty good shape. So I think we can confidently state that we, if someone is no, knows what they're doing and the instrument is well tuned, we can generate the results from samples that are representative of the sample and that uh, someone else who would do the same sample analysis would get very similar results. We can state this based on this, this evaluations. We can also say uh, state this based on some other arguments which I now briefly make. So the validation of software tools has been, I, I mentioned, with this uh, Pedro Navarro paper, and which Brandon explained on Wednesday. This was the benchmarking of the software tools. This was quite successful. But the software tools were also tested against ground truth data set. The ground truth would be a data set. Uh, they're always very difficult to generate, but these were basically a data set where uh, experts and people who really have looked at many of these peaks and traces for a long time did manual scoring, and several people who are experienced in the field took some data sets and scored them manually. This is tedious, boring work, but they would say, I believe that I, this signal is correct based on my experience, and another person, a third person, would do the same, and when they agreed, they said this is a, a signal that we have confidently identified. So this is what we call a ground truth data set, and these tools were also measured uh, against ground truth. So there's a fairly solid base to trust the results that come out from the software tools. Um, I measure, um, we, we also would say that there is methods and uh, for library generation has been generated, that we can be fairly confident if two people create a, a, a spectral library that is then used for the scoring, that these spectral libraries probably have relatively good quality and are not riddled with false positives, and also some libraries are actually, uh, that are in community used or community generated, are available. And then uh, I think an important point is that this um, error propagation analysis in large data sets came out of this cross-lab study that ben, uh, ben orchestrated and also explained uh, on, on Wednesday. And we are fairly confident, again, that several people contribute to this. To this, it was also kind of community effort that we can be quite confident that if you go from tens to hundreds or even thousands of samples and you want to consider them as a cohort, that we will, that we have the problem of of accumulating false positives quite well under control. So I think we can quite confidently state that at this point, this data, SWOT data, or DIA data, is quite intensely val validated and well supported. And I think this is from an experimental <coughs> point of view and a result and a, a experimental reproducibility, we are actually in quite good shape. We cannot do the whole proteome, but the part of the proteome we can do is, is we, we, feel, we can feel quite confident. So now I'd like to go to the last part here, the last question, which is an interesting one, and that is one, we, one which we probably is not often asked. But we can ask, if two or more people do the same experiment, let's say with a cell line, could also use mice, do they in fact get the same results? That's not assuming. That's assuming they make no mistake, they're competent, they simply do 
two experiments, two people do experiment, and they ostensibly do the same thing. What we observe a lot in, in conferences, that uh, people, someone will have a talk, present the result, and then someone says, I did the same experiment, and I got a different result, so you must be wrong. And I would like to show now that this is not necessarily so, that why, why, while, while it is occurring frequently that the result is not the same, there may be underlying biological reason. So, this is getting to this point here from Nature Publishing Group, cells, mice, or generally research reagents. So this is work from a postdoc in the lab, Yan Sheng Lu, and he only took this experiment um, because we wanted to make a contribution to the discussion of reproducibility, and it turned out to be a really inherently extremely interesting story. So it has to do with HeLa cells, which is one of the most frequently used cancer cell lines, and there is now close to 100,000 publications, 0.3% of all PubMed publications use this cell line. We could have used another cell line, like HEC, or, uh, I mean, there's, there's many that we used, and I'm, I'm sure we would get to the same conclusions. But we used HeLa because it's the most widely used cell. So now there's different flavors of HeLa cells, and this is one called CCL2, S3, and Kyoto. So you know, of course, or maybe not, but I can tell you, that these HeLa cells are derived from a person, um, Henrietta Lacks, who had a tumor, and out of these tumors, cell lines were generated some decades ago and have been continuously processed or propagated in the laboratory. You could go to ATCC, this is the, this is the American tissue type collection, and order a vial of these cells, which, which supposedly represent the source, very closely the source of the cells as they were initially uh, generated and, and, and uh, from, from the patient. So over time, three flavors have been introduced and they have different properties. So these, for instance, are strongly adherent, these are not. And, um, and here, this is not readable, but I just say it, this is a number of papers, of these tens of thousands of papers that Yan Sheng looked up, and he asked, how, how did people specify their cells? And they, these papers all just say HeLa, some papers say HeLa Kyoto, HeLa S3, and so on. So they're, they're at least a little bit more specific in what, what the cells are that they used. So most of them just write HeLa cells. Okay, so the lab, that, that the study that he undertook was, we are, it's again a cross-lab study. We collected HeLa cells from laboratories which use these cells daily. They do experiments as, as we speak on these cells. And we asked them simply for an inadequate of these cells. We grew them these cells in, in our laboratory in the same medium, same conditions, we, in, under controlled conditions. And then we, we did a, a multi-layer analysis of these cells at the molecular level and the phenotypic level. We measured the phenotype. The question was that whether if two people who uh, in these labs we wrote to do an experiment, do they actually experiment with the same cell? And would or, or do they have different have the cells are the cells variable, like we would have in this in this uh, fly strains? And if they are variable, does this matter actually in terms of the a phenotype that we measure an experiment we might do? So that was the study design, and this is what what we got. So this was the number of the cells of the Kyoto um, type. The these are the uh, CCL2 type. And then there's one outside, is S3 cells. I mean, this is not really important facts, but one of the things which is very interesting is that a group at ETH, a group of Wolf Hart, with a colleague, colleague in our department, is a very careful experimenter, and every few, every few cell divisions, he throws down the cells. So we basically have a time lapse of cells, how they behave in the lab, in the same laboratory, coming out of the same root uh, culture. And so this is, this is, for instance, the cell line 2014. We'll come back to those. They are approximately 40 divisions apart. So this is, for to put this in perspective, um, this would be for a master student who does a three or four months experiment. This would be the cells taken at the beginning of his master thesis and at the, towards the end of the master thesis. So it's a, it's a very, from point of view of experimentation, a very short time frame. So we asked, how do these cells relate to each other? 
and Jan Scheng did a lot of measurements from each one of these cells. He measured the copy number variation, the genomic, uh, the genomic variability. He measured RNA, protein steady state, and protein turnover from all of these cells. Um, uh, several layers of of omics data. Okay, so that's the experiment. Skip this. I just and so initially we can characterize these cells by some very easily readable phenotype, and that would be cell division. How quickly do they divide? And so this would be the time, and this would be the uh, basically how many cells are in the sample, and we see already that they divide quite differently. Some are slower, uh, a lot slower than others, and there's almost a factor of two in the speed with which they uh, grow under the same conditions. We already see they're phenotypically different. Uh, actually quite substantial, with a very crude phenotype to cell division. Um, skip this. So this is, the, this is simply the uh, analysis of the proteomic layer. This is exactly the tools that you, and the approaches that you learned now. So he basically used the a library. Uh, he used the tools that you, uh, the, the, the targeting, the peptide-driven tools that you used, and he created a protein map out of this repeat of, of this analysis. And so then you can do also, of course, correlation of one biological replicate against each other or between the cell lines. And this is shown here. When he does biological whole process repeats and correlates them to each other, he has a correlation coefficient of about 0.9697 or, or I can't read, maybe 0.98. It's very, so they're very reproducible. When he does between cells of the same strain type, like the Kyoto or the other branch, the correlation is lower, which means we see biological signal. When he goes between the, the, the C-cell 2 and Kyoto, the different branches, correlation is again lower, which means they're further different apart. So we, again, like in the flies, we can make the claim that through these techniques that we learned and we applied here, we see biological signal that is, um, that is clearly biological and not just a technical noise, because these, these values are substantially different this value, and that is the technical variability that is introduced over the whole process. Okay? Now we show, now we see some results. I think this is actually fascinating, um, what we see. So what this graph here is, the, the, each chromosome of the cell lines is arranged here in circular form, chromosome 1, 2, and so on. And here, are the, each, each circle is one of the cell lines. The color indicates the ploidy, so basically how many copies of that locus is present in this particular cell line. Um, <coughs> red means many copies, up to five, and, uh, and, and cold means uh, one. So we see that each cell line, simply by the copy numbers that we see, is quite different. We see certain blocks which are very constant, but we generally see blocks of genes or loci that are quite different between the cell lines, and I would like to point out one or two here. This is two cell lines, and these are the ones which are about 40 cell division cycles, well, 40 splits apart, so about three months apart, cultured in the same laboratory. And we see that these two cell lines differ in a whole chromosome, the ploidy is changed, and here substantially another chromosome. So even within the duration, of let's say a master's thesis, these cells changed in a way that their substantial chromosomal differences are observable, and we would assume that this has implications for the uh, molecular makeup, for the proteins, their functions, and, the, and how they control functions. This is the genomic layer. Now we go from this genomic layer to express transcripts and to proteins. So here is the copy number variation. Again, uh, hot is lots of copies, like high ploidy. Green is low. Here is the mRNA, and here is the protein level. Hot is again high expression, green is lower expression. So what we see immediately is that these very distinctive patterns here from, for instance, this region being highly expressed in this whole group of cells becomes much more washed out, attenuated, and almost completely, not completely, but substantially disappears or is attenuated at the protein level. So one on one effect we see that whatever the genomic variation shows us gets processed differently 
at the level of gene expression and at the level of proteins. So then we can ask, what are the correlations? So if we were to take the naive view and say, in a cancer cell line, by implication in a cancer tissue, a person has an amplification, say a copy number, or, uh, an oncogene is, is attenuated or is increased, let's say you have three copies of, a, of an oncogene, and we would then naively assume that this translates into, into one and a half times the amount of the protein of this oncogene. Just to take an example, and that is clearly not so. So we can ask how do these various levels of layers of expression correlate with each other? So this is copy number to mRNA, mRNA to protein, CNV to protein. So these are all these, all these comparisons. And when we see for each one of these comparisons, there is no predictability. There's always some correlation, but very poor. So it's not predictive how a copy number var variant, basically a genomic variant, translates into transcripts of proteins. But specifically, copy uh, mRNA and protein are not very strongly associated with each other, so it's not predictable what will happen functionally at the protein level from the transcripts. We see here, this, are, um, this is basically the variability observed at the, pro at the mRNA protein at the K loss level. This is the degradation. We see there's a decreasing value here. That means that whatever differences are occurring genomically, they're eventually buffered down to some extent towards the protein. So the protein response is generally smaller than genomic responses, also transcriptomic responses. So now, um, this is simply descriptive. Now we'd like to uh, learn something about the mechanisms, of how this attenuation happens. Where is the buffering happening? Why is not every gene equally being modulated? Why is there differences? So this is the question we'd like to answer. And so the idea here that the hypothesis we're pursuing is that it is not just the abundance of the protein, but the, but the fact that the many proteins participate in complexes and that the <coughs> complex is in which a protein participates is a buffering mechanism for that, that determines whether an amplitude change coming from genomics is actually apparent at the protein level. So the, the simple idea is that if you have a protein complex consisting of, let's say, four proteins, and three proteins are from regions, genomic regions, which are not amplified. And the fourth protein is from a region where the amplification is occurring. You have all of a sudden twice as much genes, uh, loci. Then if the protein is synthesized in higher amount, it may not find a complex to attach to because the other three components are not attenuated or amplified and it would simply be buffered down through degradation. So that's, the, that's the hypothesis we pursue. And we can do this through um, analysis, uh, statistical analysis, basically. And here is what, what we show. So we have now separate all these proteins into two groups. Those we know are participating in a complex. We call this complex in. And we know that they're in a function in a complex because we can go to a a, a, a database like quorum or, or also string, where we know that that defines proteins or bioplex from Steve Gigi over here, where we, where we know that proteins are, tend to function in a certain complex and, and which protein participates in that complex. And then we have proteins where we do not know whether they are in a complex. We, we, they can be or cannot be in a complex. We don't know. So the difference we see here between complex in and complex out in the reality will probably much be much bigger because the complex out population is containing both complex bound and non complex bound proteins. So that's just the background. Okay, now we have the complex in, complex out, they have different colors. Now we can um, we can do correlations. We can say how is the copy number variation, copy number variant, basically deploy the how many copies you have in the genome of a particular gene correlate with the mRNA. And the value here is not really so important, but the question is, do the complex in, complex out populations differ? They don't. So that means that at the level of translating a ploidy change, uh, the number of copies you have in the genome, into transcripts, there is no, the cell does not make a difference. They're treated the same. 
So the cell does not know, ultimately at the transcript level, whether a protein will be in a complex or not, which is kind of a plausible result. When we go for, co when you go for copy number variation to correlate it with the protein level, we now see a difference. We see that proteins that are complex in have a lower correlation than proteins that, that are complex out. So that means that if you have a copy number variant, so let's say ploidy goes up, that the chance that the protein is that the protein abundance is correlated with the increased ploidy is higher if the protein is in the complex than if it's out of a complex, which is consistent with extra protein being degraded if it is if it should be in a complex but it has no space to go. And we see then exactly the um, the the complement to that. When we, co when we correlate copy number to K-losses degradation, we see that proteins that are out of a that are in a complex are more strongly uh, degraded than the proteins that are not in a complex. So the conclusion we draw from this is that the proteins um, that that the that overall is that the, the genetic variants represented here with changes in diploidy based in the copy numbers is trans and translated in non-trivial, non non-linear fashion, and that one of the big buffering mechanisms, not the only one, is the organization of proteins into functional uh, complexes, which is, is, is clearly apparent from this data. Now, um, I think probably should finish soon, the, 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 we now established that people who do experiments with HeLa cells uh, don't actually do the same experiment because the underlying cell is not the same than the next person. And even if you do the same experiment three, four, five, six months apart in the same, in the same laboratory, uh, then you do a different experiment because the cell is no longer the same. I established so far that this genetic difference translates into the transcript and the protein landscape, and I described a, one mechanism how this, this um, translation is, is, is attenuated, uh, how the protein level variance is attenuated by, uh, by uh, degradation through the organization. Now this could, you could all say, well, this doesn't matter. What really matters is does the cell do the same, th the same thing. There could be somewhat slight variations in the molecular makeup, but they still are the same cells. They show the same response, which is possible. So we tested this here, and uh, this is the last part of my presentation. So it is known that, um, it, well, it, it, it has to do with the response to microRNAs. MicroRNAs are small, uh, as the name says, small uh, RNAs, and they're thought to have regulatory function in terms of gene expression. And this is, the, from the world, this is a model from the group of Wolf Hart, who have shown, has shown that this uh, particular microRNA has it attenuates the or controls the ability of a cell to be infected by salmonella. It's, he's, a, he's an infection biologist, and simply we use this here simply as a, as a phenotype. We say if we have these different cells which have different molecular makeup, do they react in the same way to the presence uh, of this perturbation, which is a uh, which is a microRNA? Do they process this? microRNA presence in the same way, or do they process in different ways? And if they process it in different ways, does this relate to the infectivity of this salmonella on these cells? So this is what we mean. It's a phenotypic assay. So this is showing if we express microRNAs in these cells, they re and these are the proteins measured, uh, the, the ratios basically of the infection of our expression of microRNA to control, we see that each cell has an, as a, as an interesting, a different pattern. We can basically go then and see which proteins react in, where, in which cells to this, to this perturbation, which is a, a clinically relevant perturbation, a microRNA. We can then ask whether they be, respond differently to this invasion of, the, of this um, bacteria, and they do. This is uh, a little hard to see, but we see here a control and we see here the attenuation, the decrease in infectivity mediated by the expression of this microRNA. So basically look at the length of this bar down here, the middle bar, and we see that this middle bar is different length. These ones don't respond at all. 
uh, I mean, to the, the, the infectivity of salmonella to these cells is not dependent or not modulated by this microRNA. And we see basically that different cells have different behavior. So this, this leads us to the conclusion that in one specific assay, a biophenotypic assay, that is quantitative, we can say that the different genomic makeup leads to different proteomic landscape, and this translates directly into a different phenotypic response. It is one phenotype, and we think this would be true for others as well, and you already showed it by the growth, by the growth rate. Since we know the proteins, that, um, that change in, in this, in, in, we can now use this phenotypic output and ask how, which proteins to correlate with this phenotypic output. And we can do exactly the same as we did in the flies. We can then say we have now an association of protein abundance to a phenotype, a quantitative phenotype. We can ask which proteins do ha do have are, are involved in manifesting or, or, or generating this phenotype. And I don't have time to talk about that, but it's very clear that we could identify when we look which proteins determine the infectivity that it leads us to re receptor proteins, which are the docking sites for bacteria to go in. It's actually quite a beautiful story. So the summary would be that um, a panel of HeLa cells randomly collected from different labs shows substantial variability in gene dosage. This translates in nonlinear, non-transparent ways into expression patterns. Um, proteome organization is a major buffer of variability of expression. Uh, this one I skipped. Proteome variability closely associates with a complex phenotype. And so this is basically indicating that if two people, two research groups do ostensibly the same experiment, if they're not very careful with that they take cells that are ca carefully characterized or directly from ATT ATCC, they may do different experiment unwittingly, and they might beat each other up at the conference and say, oh, I found this and the other found that. And, and the reason is that the underlying biology is different. And so I uh, think that from the point of view of re reproducibility of research results, which I started out, this is a really important component because it does not mean it has large implications for experimental biology, because it does not mean that people make mistakes, that they make, make results up, or that they are simply sloppy. It simply means that we need to find a way, I think, in, the, in experimental biology to also carefully characterize the research materials like cell lines, mouse strains, yeast strains, and so on because they also tend to evolve. It is not so like if you buy sodium chloride from somewhere, it's gonna be exactly the same sodium chloride like the other person buys. If you use it 10 years later, it's still the same sodium chloride. This is not true with living systems. They evolve, they change, and somehow or another, if you're serious about experimental variability and to avoid it, we need to somehow document the research results, including cells and strains that we're actually working with. So this is kind of the message that I'd um, like to, uh, wanted to convey. And uh, so it's not sufficient to say we do exact measurements, we have exact software tools, we also need to document the research reagents. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention. I hope you could, you found the course um, inspiring and useful, you learned a lot of useful things, and I certainly hope that many will use uh, the skills you learned here for your own uh, research on a hopefully daily basis and for a long time. Uh, thanks, and I'm happy to answer questions if there someone has a question. Yes? Um, so you talked about using some of the inbred strains of mice um, as uh, sort of the variability. Yeah. But is there a, an outbred strain, collection of outbred mice that could yeah. also be yeah. used? And how, how, much, how much more information can we get from the outbred strain? Yes, yeah, so this is a complicated question, but well, the answer is complicated. It's, it's not so clear what means more information. Uh, it, the, the, 
there's some shortcomings on both sides. If you have an outbreak, outbreak uh, population which basically mimics a patient population as it might appear in the clinic, then you have absolutely no control over the number of SNPs, the randomly distributed the variation, and you have a, a, a huge variability. So about in the, in the human population, mouse probably it's similar, about one in a thousand SNPs. So we have a huge amount of unstructured variability, and the question is how big would your cohort need to be to really see associations that you could reduce to a specific mutation in the sea of all the other mutations that occur. So that's the, that's the, the benefit of an outbred mouse population would be it mimics basically what the human population looks like, but it's very complicated variability structure. These, these panels that we that I talked about on Wednesday, which also exist for yeast, they also exist for Arabidopsis. Um, they, they are also variable, they kind of mimic a pop outbreak population, but the stru there is structure in the variance because for each allele, you either have the one or the other, not, not, the, not the third one. And so I simply ask, what is the distribution of these uh, alleles? The, Upside is that the variability is more structured, is easier to deal with, simpler. The downside is that the number of SNPs is much lower. It's about, I think this, this BXC, it's, it's, it's about millions, less than a million SNPs. So the, the, re, the, the distance between two SNPs is, is, tends to be, uh, on average, uh, quite large. So I think not, none is better than the other. We, my, view, my view is we, is always that if you cannot explain something in, to some extent in a rather simple system, uh, you will have probably no chance to explain it in a very, in a very complicated system. And that's why we started working with this um, BXD mice, because it is, it is structurally simpler, and I think if we cannot make headway there, we would be, I would not be confident to go to an outbreak, outbreak population. And I think we learn stuff with these mice, and we would of course like to extrapolate to, to outbreak mice, or actually humans. Yes. Well, so you were talking about um, multi-element approaches and how um, you went to this conference and there was very few talks on yes. uh, And I'm kind of, with the work you showed today, it, it kind of looks like it, it might be very difficult to really ever do a true multi-element approach if each of those, those omics themselves have such variability. Yes, so, of course, each, each level so I think there's two things. There's two or three things. One is the is the ability to measure at each level somewhat precisely. I mean, if you if of course each level measures something, and it's extremely noisy, and then you want to somehow integrate that, you integrate noise against noise, and nothing will come out. What I try to show is that at least at the proteomic level, and I think we can also be very confident that at the transcriptomic level, the results, the data is actually quite quite good quality, and we we do see. Clearly, it's at the transcriptomic level and also the proteomic level, biological signals that are uh, that are beyond the level of the noise. So I think this is a prerequisite, and this is this is fulfilled. Um, now, the this variability, of course, at each level, and if we were able to precisely predict how a let's say copy number variant translates into transcripted proteins we would not need all these measurements because we, one would be predictive of the other and therefore we would not need to do more than one type of measurement and, and this, is not, this is not so. The different layers uh, tell us a different type of variability. They're not strongly correlated, it means one you cannot predict one from the other and that means if the, if the measurements at each layer are actually informative that we see different parts of the same system. So this is the encouraging thing that by adding additional data layers we see we, we obtain more information that is not obtainable from one measurement alone. And so then the question is how do we use this added information, how can we extract this added information? And that is, a, that is the challenge. I talked on Wednesday about simply correlating, this is not probably going to work. And I think some, info, some, some integration on the level of prior knowledge I talked, I showed with these flies is the string network as a prior knowledge which show nicely that certain functions uh, 
are synchronously consisting of multiple factors, are synchronously uh, modulated, and I think that's the type of, of, uh, of approach one would need to, uh, to take. But, I, but I, I'm not saying at all that this is that it's clear to us or actually to anyone how one exactly does this best. This is a field of a lot of uh, discussion and different approaches are being, are being tested. I think it is necessary uh, that we figure out how to do this best. And it's a, it's a research challenge. Actually, we had a very interesting discussion with Olga over these days how one might um, pursue that from a, from a statistical point of view. Yes? So that way you're not actually detecting you're not detecting the proteins of regular. You're detecting that it's being degraded. Yes. How would you do that? Oh, so this is by uh, basically pulse chase labeling. So you would take the cells at one point, time point when they're growing. Then we add a marker to the cells, and then we measure how the cell, how this marker integrates into the protein. And we have then two forms of a protein: the old, which is not marked and the new, which is marked, and then we can calculate the lifetime, basically, and, uh, and calculate the degradation. And in the past, these are very old experiments, these are the pulse experiments or pulse chase experiments. In the old times, this was done with radioactivity. So you call, uh, the typical example would be you would grow a cell and add S35-methionine. Uh, S35 is a radioactive form of methionine, and then you measure simply how much radioactivity was incorporated and give you a, a synthesis rate of this, of this protein. And now we can mass spectrometer, we can do this too. We don't use radioactive labels. We use uh, stable isotope labels like carbon-13 or, or N, uh, N15. And so they're heavy, they're not radioactive, but they're distinguishable because they have an extra neutron in the nucleus of this atom. And the mass spectrometer can distinguish the mass of a carbon-13 from a carbon-12 or an N15 from an N14, and so we, we feed basically, uh, let's say, carbon-13 carbon labeled amino acids to the cell culture, and we measure the, in, the incorporation of this particular amino acid over time. And this can be distinguished based on the mass in the mass spectrometer. So we can say uh, how, what's the old protein behaving, how quickly is it decaying, how quickly is the new protein being synthesized, so these are measurements. This can be deduced from the uh, quantitative measurements. Yes? Um, one point uh, would have been nice to uh, be nice to the question. Two research groups, the same results, they come up with the same conclusion. I don't use <laughs> A lot more by looking into the old data sets that have been generated already instead of always doing our own experiments. Yes, so this is actually a very good idea. Uh, we, we know that this is uh, not so. Uh, we, we, we do this inadvertently now with uh, in an EU, EU project we have uh, or we participate in. Um, this is headed by Maria Rodriguez, she's at IBM, and she's a computational biologist. And the whole, re the whole, the whole uh, EU project basically tries to answer your question, not not from the point of view of reproducibility, but from the from the question which is the best way to analyze data. So specifically, we generate in the in this EU project data sets uh, that have a certain structure. For instance, tumor biopsies compared to controlled tissue from the same person. Or cell lines that have been perturbed uh, in a time course, in a dosage course, with a, with a cancer drug. So these are structured data sets. Each one consists of several hundred, two to three hundred measurements. And then uh, we, de we, ask, we ask a question, like, can you separate tumor from normal, or can you find a target of a particular drug when you know the molecular makeup and you know the drug response. So these are sim these are questions. And then the, the consortium consists of computational biologists <coughs> who use different approaches to answer this, to find this answer. So some are machine learning scientists, uh, some are 
biologists who have studied like specific biochemical pathways for a very long time, so they are very rich in prior information. Some are very rich in computation knowledge, but no, uh, no prior information. And then there's various kind of colors in between. And the question that we try to pursue is, given the data set, given an answer that we know, I mean, tumor or control, the answer is known, who does, which approach or combination of approaches is doing the best to generate results, basically the question you ask. And so this is ongoing, uh, I, I don't know, but the it is very clear that not all techniques which are used to an analyze such data sets lead to the same results, or even to the right results. And so the question is which one is the best, which can we combine them? Another issue is how stable are they? Because we also observed already that when you do, for instance, clustering, and when you have 100 cases and controls, and you do clustering, you, some clusters might emerge. Clusters would be interpreted as clinical groups that have a certain, certain disease phenotype. And when you then take only half of the sample, so you take another cohort, uh, some of these clusters become very unstable. And they're probably statistical artifacts. Or, uh, so these are issues which I think need to be addressed. Generally, by publishing, uh, when you want to go to nature, if you say, I found one cluster, and one clinical group, uh, then they will say, this is probably not so interesting. If you say, I have, a new, I have five new breast cancer subtypes based on clustering, they will be interested. So the, the more clusters you find, the, the more appealing it is. But if they're all unstable, then it's going to be wrong. Well, so it depends on the limiting means, right? I mean, it, 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 but if, you've shown, if you just have only a few cells, like uh, some kind of stem cell proteomics, it's not going to help you. Uh, because then you would probably do the only option single cell, some kind of single cell uh, genomics. If you have some, I think if we, could, well, we can say confidently, if you have biopsy level, needle biopsy level uh, samples, which is very frequently the case also in, in tumor, uh, then uh, then you have the options would be sort of genomics, transcripts, metabolites, and, and proteomics. I would I would think that's that's my personal view, is that the, you should focus on if you can only do one, one type of measurement, you would focus on the one that has the likely the most information. And so uh, this is now probably most would agree with that. Then the way the disagreement starts, which measurement is that? It is clear that the transcript measurements, which are clearly used a lot and very successfully, the, you have the advantage that you basically can measure every transcript. In the pro protein world, we cannot do that. We have a certain fraction um, uh, that of the protein we can measure. From need needle biopsies, this may be now with high with new instrument, high end instruments, in the range of maybe four or five thousand proteins. So maybe half of the proteins which are expressed in these cell types. Uh, so that's the, that's the discrepancy at the coverage. On the other hand, is the discrepancy on the information contents. And with all these correlations between mRNA and protein, clearly there's, there's the protein level is not predictable, at least not strictly. But if you believe that the protein is the functionally informative unit, uh, we conclude that we would rather measure protein. So we, our, our assumption is we gain more information by going closer to the function, even though we don't measure all, than if we go further away from the function but we can measure all. But that's not actually uh, clear whether this is true. This is a, is an assumption, and simply also because we know how to do proteomics. Uh, but, but I think it's going in that, in that direction. Ideally, if you had two needle biopsies, you would do both. And then you have additional angle on the same problem. So it costs more money. 
Yeah. I have a question about the, uh, now we are trying to do, for example, proteomics, genomics, but this uh, technology have different, uh, uh, I mean, measurement range, uh, the dynamic range, yes. uh, the magnitude. So how to, if we correlate, they may not be in the same dynamic range, so they, the correlation, how reliable are this correlation? Yes, so you probably not measure, you probably not correlate the absolute abundance, which is actually quite difficult to to generate even in in RNA, and um, uh, you would probably generate you probably correlate fold change. Like usually, the, the what's what's co correlate is the is the is a fold change to the mean or something over the cohort. And then, uh, so that's that's quite straightforward. That's fr frequently done. Then the question, of course, is how variable is the individual measurement, and that, that's why I think it's always good to do some repeats, analysis, technical and biological repeats of a cohort to then make these two curves, right? the, the, the basically the technical or uh, CV distribution and the across cohort between samples in correlation. If these two curves go apart, I mean, I'm talking about, talking about these two curves, I think if they're, this should be done at both levels, and if they're apart, and I think it's, wor it's worthwhile to do this joint analysis, if they, in one of the techniques or in both, they basically converge, I would not use this, this data. The dynamic range actually is also an interesting issue. Transcripts have a very narrow dynamic range and are actually very low in cells. So we once measured this in POMBI. This is a, it's a yeast uh, cell, a single cell or eukaryote, and the highest expressed transcript was a uh, was uh, about 800 copies per cell, and the mean, the mean of transcripts was about three and a half copies per cell. Very, very low. And the proteins, of course, they range from few to 10 million. So the dynamic range of proteins is much expanded, and uh, it also means then that the protein, the energy used to maintain the protein, is in or is, is orders of magnitude higher than the energy required to to maintain the transcriptome, which is basically free, because the copies are so low uh, that uh, fluctuations are very easy to accomplish. But when you need the cell needs to make uh, a million new ribosomes, this is a, this is a very substantial synthetic uh, effort. So where, where was the replication started in that in that experiment? Is it, is it like straight from? Full process replicates. Yes. So these were these were full process replicates, uh, and uh, I think we, if possible, or it, we would also do just re, what we call replicate, re technical replicates, re injections of the same sample, like for instance this cross lab lab study, or full process replicates where you take the same sample. Ideally, when you, in case of culture cells, maybe even take different cultures. So this is a bit of effort, but I think this is reassuring, because if these two curves were basically very close, you would you could do all kinds of computing, and you would never be sure that you actually see something meaningful. In fact, you probably would not. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention. I wish you a good return home.